Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. I know there are bigger fish to fry, as it were, today with England and the European Championships and the final. Um, but I wanted to get a Tottenham Hotspur update in there beforehand. Just to, you know, you might want to fill the time ahead of that, or you may be watching this tomorrow. You might be thinking, Tottenham Hotspur, back seat today. It's time to watch England, although I know there's a lot of people that watch these videos who aren't English as well. So it may give you something else to focus on. Um, so let's talk Tottenham Hotspur and what they've been up to in the last week or so. It's been pretty much all about pre-season and a little bit of transfer stuff, which I will talk about as well, but very much pre-season. We're getting to see the Nuno Espirito Santo era begin at Hotspur Way. From those I've spoken to within the club, although let's be honest, they're not going to say much different, there's been very good vibes about him and he's come in in a you know, everyone pretty much saying what a what a lovely man he is. Um, I know lovely being lovely doesn't win your trophies and all of that, but certainly it's it's got to be a start because we know that whoever came in had to essentially kind of bring everyone together. And from what I'm told, you know, there's a good mood so far, and um, players seem to be responding to what he's asking of them, putting on some really good sessions, and yeah, the staff behind the scenes as well. He's been very good with, you know, very much. Uh, as anyone would in a new job, you know. I'm not trying to paint this as a as a as a guy that is a winner from day one or any of this stuff, and hopefully he will be. But this is just very much a guy I'm looking to make a good first impression at his new club, knowing the messy search that eventually led to him being appointed. And uh, yeah, from what I hear, he's he's come in and he's um, made a good impression. So I mean, in terms of players back, it's the ones we kind of expected. It's the non-internationals, pretty much. Um, some good news was seeing Oliver Skip back. I, I wrote a piece just a few days back saying that he was ahead of recovery, uh, ahead of his recovery time. Um, and then I think it was, was it Friday? It was either Friday or Saturday. I think the club showed him kind of taking part in some group exercises. From what I understand, uh, they're hoping that he'll be back in full uh, full training with the group next week, which is brilliant. Because if any, if I'm trying to remember... I write so many things, I do so many videos, I try and remember which and what I've said in various ones, but I would have said in either written word or spoken word that for me it was key for Oliver Skip was to uh, have a lot of time working with Nuno Espirito Santo this summer um, because Nuno Espirito Santo has a record, and don't worry, I'm not going to say his full name every single time I say it. Uh, he's got a very good record working with young players in certain positions, and central midfielder is one of them. Um, you know, Ruben Neves obviously did very good things with uh, Wolves, very young central midfielder. And before that, Andre Gomez, who's obviously now an Everton player, but back when he was at Valencia, he was a player that he really shone um, in his first season at Valencia, as in the Spirit of Santos first season at Valencia when they finished fourth and, and did some very good things. So, you know, he knows how to bring on young midfielders. And from what I was told, um, I can't remember if I said this in the previous video or not, I've certainly have written about it, is that um, the whole point and a lot what was being impressed upon coaches that were interviewing was that the club were very keen for Oliver Skip and Ryan Sessegnon to be integrated kind of back into the first team setup and being, a, um, you know, an important part of the, the squad going forward. You know, I'm not saying they're going to start every week or anything like that, but I'm saying that the club were keen for those two who are very talented young English, you know, England under 21 internationals to start becoming a part, a real part of Tottenham Hotspur life in the Premier League and more. Um, and from what I understand, uh, Spirito Santo was very keen for that as well. So obviously that, that ticks a lot of a lot of boxes for him in that regard. Um, and yeah, like I say, so skip back in full training. Ryan Session on, uh, skip back in full training next week. Um, I don't know whether that means from tomorrow or from within next week, but certainly whatever. Back from, if you weren't aware, he had a metatarsal injury in his foot in the penultimate game of the season. I think it was at Reading. They played against Reading, yeah. I think it was at home, Norwich. Um, and, he, yeah, he needed surgery on that. And so he's just back pretty much at the perfect time. You know, missed, what, a couple of days of early pre-season, which is no big deal, really. That's mainly about fitness anyway, which he'll have been working on on the side anyway. So uh, I've already said my thoughts on him and how I think a, a double pivot with him and Hoybier would actually be pretty cool because they're both very much box-to-box -box midfielders and we've seen that of Hoybier in the uh, Euros as well. And Skip has got a lovely passing range, really, really good passing range as well uh, as everything he does defensively. So I'd be intrigued to see whether that's how he's used. Uh, with Sessegnon, as I've said before, 
it's all very much dependent on formation with him of how many minutes and what he gets because if you're playing a normal back four obviously you've got Davies and Regal on there and as far as I'm aware neither look likely to move on this summer which means obviously Session will be battling with them unless um, Espirito Santo comes in and says look I know you guys have been looking at him as a as a left back I think actually maybe he is better suited to a more attacking role or as a wing back we'll see but I know for a fact that Espirito Santo tried to sign Session on a couple of times at Wolves he's very much a player he likes so he will get chances um, obviously if they play a back three then Davies comes back into that kind of left-sided uh, role of the three centre-backs which would then mean Session's only fighting with Regalon for a left wing-back role um, but yeah, be interesting to see how how it works out. I think we'll get a good indication, obviously, in the early friendlies as well. So those two are going to be hopefully be f heavily involved. You know, I, I don't think anyone. I mean, Espirito Santo, obviously, having brought Wolves up from the Championship, would have been keeping a close eye on the Championship since then. He will have seen what Norwich and certainly Skip did for Norwich last uh, season. You know, he was phenomenal, brilliant. I've, seen, I've had a lot of people kind of. Not a lot, sorry, that's that's over over top. I've had a few people saying to me, oh, but, you know, I still don't think Skip's going to make it. He's another Tom Carroll, Harry Winks. He's not. He's really not. He's a very different player from both of those players. Um, you know, tried to watch as much of Norwich as I could last season, um, obviously with kind of one eye on Skippy's development. Um, so Skippy, sounds like my, his best mate, isn't it? Um, that's just what he's called around the club. And I think I've covered him for so long, I kind of end up calling him that quite a lot as well. Um, yeah, he will have seen how, how good a player the Spirit of Santa that Skip is and can be. You know, Jose Mourinho even said he'd be a future Tottenham Hotspur captain. So keep an eye on him. Keep an eye on him. He's only 20 as well. Uh, Jeff at Tanganga was back doing some group work. I don't believe he's back in full training yet. I think that's very much just him coming back from injury as well, but hopefully not too long. You know, and, and for someone that always bangs on about homegrown rules and foreign player limits and all that, that's... Three British players, English players, straight off the bat, all three England under-21 internationals who could play a more increased role this season. I know we all love transfers and I know we all love seeing exciting new faces come in, but for me, I love to see those kind of young players getting a chance at the club and I think all three are more than good enough as well. Uh, so let's see what happens with them. Um, what else? I've kind of been watching all any little bits of video and everything that come out of the club, really kind of studying them, apart from having to write articles about them. I just find it fascinating to just kind of glean what you can from the um, the training sessions. I mean, for fitness wise, certainly seems to be various focus on um, upper body strength uh, in the fitness stuff. You know, you probably would have seen them using either a bit like the NFL use the kind of the big pads that they go up against. Um, they've been using these big, like almost like oversized exercise balls that the players kind of bash back against. And they've got to, on the pitches, twist and turn and be battered from the back while trying to twist and turn and take the ball away. So kind of very much a real, um, yeah, kind of a focus certainly on having more upper body strength about them and more ability to to take the ball, I guess, in tight situations, be able to turn even if someone's kind of slamming into the back of you. So I thought some of that was really interesting. Um, Matt Doherty did a really good interview that's worth looking at. He's always quite honest when he does interviews, which I really like. Other than kind of slamming his own form and saying he will be a lot better this season, um, and there's various reasons. He spoke about COVID as well, having a bit of an impact on him as well, just when he was getting a bit of a run in the team. But other than that, he says, you know, what you'll you'll find with Espirito Santo pre-season, because obviously he had him at Wolves, uh, and he described him as a world-class coach as well, which is quite interesting. Obviously, you know, the cynical others would say he would say that because he wants him to pick him. But um, he says, you know, he's very hands-on on on the training pitch. He's very, very hands-on. He will go around to each individual player and very much tell them what he wants to see from them during training sessions and what he believes they can do. Um, And obviously... A bit like Pochettino, I'd heard this before. It's a lot of it is fitness based, as where he, he expects a very high level of fitness um, to be able to kind of his teams to be absolutely still going at the opposition at the very end of matches as well. Which you know, from everything I kind of heard out of the club during the Mourinho era, it was more focused on tactics and fitness. Um, so those players are going to get their work. You know, they're going to get a workout, which is good for them, especially Tongi Ondembele, who. Um, God told me when I interviewed him a few months back that he'd um, he actually 
told his mates he wanted to quit Spurs after that first Pochettino preseason. He said it was so tough it almost killed him. Um, so it'd be good to kind of he'll be on a much fitter place now anyway. He'll be able to handle that. And I thought it was really interesting. I watched one of the videos where I just said about Spirit of Santa going over and having little chats with players. You could see him go over to Ondombele and have a real chat with him. And Ondombele, Ondombele certainly seems to be smiling. He seems, you know, he's, he's a funny character. I, I, I've, you know, been very fortunate to interview him a couple of times, and he's he's an absolute delight to interview. He's very honest. He's funny. He's got like a bit of a dry sense of humour. Um, always wears that beanie hat in training. It can be 120 degrees. Things could be catching a light on the football pitch and Tongi would still be wearing his little beanie hat that he trains in. Don't know how he does it. It's incredible. Um, but yeah, that was good to see him having a little kind of one-to-one chats with him out there. And I'm sure we'll... I was told that, you know, there would have been one-to-one chats at Hotspur Way as well. You know, we saw him in the Amazon documentary, Mourinho calling players in, telling them what he expected of them. Those will be happening with Espirito Santo as well. He'll be talking to all the players, telling them what they want. You know, we saw Delhi back. Delhi's Put in a lot of work in pre-season. He went off to Dubai to the... Um, oh, I can never remember this. It's NAS, and I can't remember what it stands for. It's the NAS Sports uh, Complex in Dubai. And he went there, I think, with Carl Walker-Peters and really kind of pushed himself. Um, he looks incredibly fit. He does. Um, but as we know with Delhi, it's all about kind of actions speak louder than the words, as it were. And, you know, he's saying all the right things. It was an interview he did with Goal with Nizar Kinsella, who's a very good journalist. I uh, did an interview with him. I think it was, as some people go, oh, they rolled their eyes. It was something to do with a charity-based Fortnite game or something, but hey, it was charity. But the actual words he said were very good. He said, look, I don't blame anyone else. It's my fault kind of thing. If things haven't gone my way, it's because of me. And this is something that I've said before. It's always been the feeling within the club is that no one can make Delhi the best again or such a terrific player again other than Delhi Alley. Um, he's very different. You know, we're just talking about Ondembele. Ondembele is all about natural ability. He was just born with incredible gifts, things he can do with the football. So even if he's not absolutely 100% on his kind of mental side of his game, the, his natural ability can still coast him and, and pass certain parts of games and, and make magical things happen. Delhi is a different kind of player. Delhi obviously has skills and all of that, but mainly his game is about the drive, the box-to-box aspect, the timing of getting into the penalty area at that right moment and then the finishing. And if you're not 100% in that zone to do that, then your game will suffer. Um, and that's always been the thing at Spurs in the last, God, it's almost three years now since we've really seen prime Dem- Delhi. Uh, we've seen little glimpses, but we haven't seen a consistency that you had under Poch, like peak Poch. Um, yeah, he just has to want it. So obviously, there would be some people who will say, "Look, the preseason friendlies before last season, Delhi was smashing it. There was a game, was it Reading, perhaps in a friendly? He was like, he was unplayable." Eric Dyer and Mourinho both said, "We've got the old Delhi back." And then obviously, something happened in that Everton match. Half time, boom, barely seen again. Um, but I hope Delhi comes back. I, I'm a Delhi fan. I think what he can do is superb. And he was one of the brightest prospects prospects in Europe. And I hope he can get back there. So let's see. You know, Spirit of Santo could, could bring it out of him. Just sometimes you just need the right manager. And obviously Mourinho Klee just wasn't right for him. Some people need to be pushed. Some people need to be shown a bit of TLC. Some players need somewhere in the middle. Um, and, and not everyone works for every manager. You know, we saw that with Mourinho. I think he got probably the best out of Kane. He got a better on Dembele. Um, but there were some players that, you know, it, it didn't quite work with. You know, Delhi being one. I think Bale, obviously, there was a slightly awkward relationship going on there as well. Um, and we will sp- see this with Spirito Santo as well. There'll be certain players that he absolutely gets a new level out of, and there'll be certain ones that maybe it just doesn't click for. But um, in terms of players we haven't seen yet, obviously we know everyone at the Euros and Copa America will be that little bit later. Um, I'm told Sonny will be back. I think he's planned to be back tomorrow, which is Monday. Um, If you're watching this, obviously, on Monday, it's today. Um, So we get Sonny back. And I'd hope, fingers crossed, once he's back, it won't be long till we get that new contract announcement because, obviously, then you can do all the stuff associated with it. Um, Serge Aurier. Serge Aurier, I believe, is back in the UK now and 
Should see him back at pre-season training, hopefully later this week. Obviously, as you would have seen this week, there's always a first day where they have to do all like tests and, and things like that, where you don't, you maybe don't see them so much. Like Sergio Reguilon was back last Monday with a few other players, and nothing was kind of shown on social media. I think it was only the only way anyone would have known was that Reguilon put a photo of the changing room up, but then it was on Tuesday that they did all the social, oh, the players are back and all that. And I think that probably because that coincided with the Spirit of Santo coming out of self-isolation from the lodge and being able to go across and actually properly involve and talk to players. It may have just been that. That's the thing. But yeah, so Aurier back uh, at some point this coming week. Um, obviously, Aurier is an interesting situation because clearly he wants to leave the club and clearly Tottenham would be quite happy for him to leave the club. It's just a case now of getting someone to bid uh, a realistic value for Tottenham for a player that, you know, is in his final 12 months of his contract now. So, yeah, we'll see what happens with Oreo, but certainly we'll be back to pre-season training. Um, who else we've got? Troy Parrott, people might not have noticed. From what I understand, I believe he's been doing some work with the under-23s, but is set to join up with the first team next week uh, to get more involved in that as well. I'm, I must admit, I'm not entirely... Un- I'm not entirely sure of why that is, why he's been working under 23s, but I don't want to speculate. I don't want to link it to this, but all I would say is that I remember Mourinho saying something about Parrot, not last season, but the one before, about how he had to make sure, because of his age, he was still very much also part of that under 23s group. I think he used, I can't remember who it was. Oh, I think it was McTominay. He, uh, McTominay used as a, as a comparison. It was really important for the other under-23s players to really respect them, even though they knew you were capable of playing at a different level. And I think he said he felt that Parrott didn't have that at that point. So he went back to the under-23s, played a few games, scored some goals, kind of reintegrated himself to it. Um, and maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe it's just getting him back and saying, look, you know, you you just kind of ground yourself slightly and then we'll let Nuno take a proper look at you as well um, next week. And you'd imagine he'll be involved in some friendlies as well. I think by the looks of it, he's going to go out on loan. Um, The preference would be the championship, but obviously I think there'll be a fair few clubs that want him. He struggled slightly in the championship with Millwall at times, which it was a difficult Millwall side, I'd say, for a young player to come into and play. They were having their own struggles. Did slightly better at Ipswich in League One. Um, but I think, you know, I see some people writing him off on social media already. It's like, I wrote a piece this week on him, you know, or, <sighs> he's only 19 years old. Um, last season was all about educating him on what the senior games were like, what it's like getting absolutely bashed around by big adult defenders rather than playing against people roughly around your own age. And, you know, and we saw him score his first couple of goals for Republic of Ireland as well against, I think it was Andorra, wasn't it, right at the end of the season. So he's got plenty of development to do. He's got plenty of more lessons to learn. I will always use Harry Kane as the perfect example for anyone in the academy going out on loans. Harry Kane had four loans and then came back at 21. Um, and that was when, obviously, um, Sherwood used him a little bit. Then Potch, obviously, really developed him. Um, and Parrot's 19. Still two years away from even that. I think... Because we see sometimes these wonder kids that come onto the scene, the, the Roonies, the Mbappes, the, some of these players like that, it doesn't mean that every player is like that. It's actually quite rare. A lot of players mainly will develop through a... You're about to get a really rubbish ice cream van that goes past my house almost every day. It's one of those where the music sounds like it um, sounds like it's kind of stuck in a slow-mo. It always reminds me of the old Eric Morecambe joke about a police car but that is definitely an age one so I'm not going to go that because I'm going to have probably younger viewers going what is he talking about but yeah so Troy Parrott in first team training hopefully um, this coming week having worked with the under 23s in recent days um, I think the other thing I was going to say about it is I'm intrigued to see myself now how many of the players this is a totally different direction we're going in but are vaccinated I noticed Sergio Reguilon yesterday on Instagram showing himself getting his vaccination You'd imagine that, you know, if they haven't been already, Spurs would want everyone, you know, obviously you can pick and choose, you know, it's 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 not, you don't have to take a vaccine if you don't want, although obviously being myself, someone who's, who's double jabbed now and everything, um, I'd, I, you'd imagine Spurs would be, would be wanting them to all be, at least have a decent level of protection by the time they get to the Premier League season, because, you know, 
Nobody wants people missing with because uh, they're isolating or positive tests next. Um, so, uh, well, they'd have to with the new rules, but as in you'd have to have a positive test to isolate because obviously with close contact from is it August the 19th? Yeah, I think it's August the 19th. Obviously, you don't have to isolate, but yeah, you'd think in terms of the Premier League, football clubs miss enough players as it is with injuries and, and other issues like that. So if they can eliminate one potential reason for absences and uh, and obviously, you know, as Doherty said, you know, was someone that struggled a little bit with it as well. And I think other players did too. Getting them vaccinated is surely going to be uh, almost like a bit of an insurance policy for the club. So, yeah, I'd be interested to see kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's one of those personal medical things. So unless the players tell us or as Regulon did in his Instagram, you know, you're unlikely to know where they have, but you'd think it would be kind of sensible now for uh, footballers to all to all get that. You know, there's certainly, it's been a little while now that they've been able to do that. So um, everything's happened so quick as well. I'm kind of, I must admit, I am quite excited in terms of, I, I lo- I've been loving the Euros. Obviously, whatever happens with England tonight, which we'll talk about a little bit towards the end of this, um, I do love, I've, I've been loving what they've been doing. And, and you know, Southgate's team about absolute, uh, Absolutely swept everyone up in what they're doing, but for me, I'm st- I still love club football. I really, really do. And for me to have the friendlies coming up so soon, uh, I must admit, there's a bit of me that misses going off on the pre-season tour. I do love those. They're they're really good in terms of getting to speak to all the players. You know, you interview almost every player during a pre-season tour, and also have a couple of sit downs with the manager, which have been very helpful with Espirito Santo, and you just kind of get a better sense of the group. But what they are doing, um, obviously, to try and eliminate risk from COVID and all that, is is they've got these range of friendlies that are happening um, in England. And then they're coming up really quickly. Next six days' time, next Saturday, we've got um, Spurs are at Orient for the J3 trophy, uh, the Justin Edinburgh trophy, which is a very good course, obviously. Former Orient manager and uh, Spurs defender, sadly, no longer with us. Um, so they're at Orient on the Saturday and I think on the Wednesday night. I think they're at Colchester. Then the next Wednesday, they're at MK Dons. And then we've got this, the Mind series of London matches, which we'll see Spurs go to, I think, Stamford Bridge first in early August. And then Arsenal will play at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium as well. So football's, I know it's talking about football's coming home. Football's coming back for Spurs so quickly. Um, and I love it. I, I, I do, I've, I'm at the stage now where I miss, massively miss covering live football. And I want to see. In the Spirit of Santo team in action. I want to see how it's going to start to look. I want to see how he integrates some of these younger players, like I was saying. And, and you know, in pre-season training, we've seen the likes of Dane Scarlett's in there. Niall John looked very sharp in some of the videos I've seen. The young midfielder, he was Scholar of the Year last year. Um, Jack Clark's back in there. I don't think I've seen Dennis Serkin. I don't know whether he's working with the under-23s at the moment. Although, saying that, I know... It was either yesterday or the day before a lot of the under-23s were involved as well because I saw Keon Atete, um, Janil Bennett, I saw a fair few. So I think that's what we're obviously going to see because there's a fair few back. He's got a majority of his first team back. He just hasn't got those kind of Euros and Copa America players yet. But he actually got a fair whack of first team players. And when you add some of the more exciting youngsters from the under-23s and under-18s, like I say, those friendlies are going to be really cool. So I'm going to all of them. I'm kind of... And, and obviously, we're going to get fans back in them as well. I don't know how it's going to work, certainly for the one on the 17th in terms of away fans, but I'd imagine the other ones, surely the clubs will be able to open that up now. And by the sounds of it, if everything goes as it's planned, we're going to get full stadiums again, uh, which will be awesome. I think we've seen that with Wembley and the Euros, just what it's like to have full stadiums again. It's incredible. I cannot wait to see, you know, Spurs are going to need all the help they can get in that first big game against the Manchester City. Espirito Santo and his players really are. So, you know, God, if, if you get a packed house for the first game of the season, all roaring Spurs on, um, it's going to be something special. I just hope it's a really positive result. But yeah, so those friendlies, really looking forward to them coming up very soon. It literally will be one every few days. Um, I'm going to get a real sense. I'm hoping we're going to get to actually talk to him. Um, I... I'd imagine there will be a press conference before um, those. I don't know whether it will be before the friendlies or not, but I'm told there will be a press conference. It has to be. Uh, he's going to have some awkward questions. Of course, he is. After that 
messy 72 days of searching for you know, a manager, a head coach that ended up being a Spirit of Santa and we know he wasn't one of the original choices. Um, he's going to have some kind of awkward questions to ask, but answer, but he'll know that's coming. He will. He'll know what some of the journalists are going to ask. Uh, a little brief word about some of his coaching staff, if you weren't aware. Ian Cathro is his assistant head coach. Ian Cathro is fascinating. I have really kind of dug in and uh, had a little look at him and everything that he's been up to. This is a guy who... He is kind of a bit of a kind of a bit of a young kind of coaching genius. Well, I say genius. That's because that's what Spirit of Santos called him. I've seen other people that he's worked with called him that. He, yeah, he was very very young. He worked. He started in school, set up an academy uh, within a school in Dundee, I think it was, where he was his hometown, which produced players. I think it was Ryan. Gould, I think it is, um, the young Scottish player. And there's another player, is it Suter as well, I think, that came out of that. And Dundee United noticed this and that were like, was it was either Dundee United or Dundee FC? I think it was Dundee United noticed this and brought him, those players, and the academy within, to their, uh, within their academy. Because, you know, they were like, who is this kid doing this? And while he was there, he worked through his coaching badges. And while he was on the... Um, I think he did his Scottish coaching badge. Well, yeah, with did his pro license with the SFA, uh, Scottish FA, and that's where he met uh, Espirito Santo, and the two just clicked. Um, and he took him to, I think it was Rio Ave was his first Portuguese side. The way he went there, obviously he was only probably early twenties, early to mid twenties then. Um, he then followed him to Valencia. I think he then came back and he was assistant manager at Newcastle to. Steve McLaren and then Rafa Benitez, who both raved about him as a young coach. Then he went off and did a a little stint because his his hope was always to become a head coach himself. He did a little stint at Hearts, which didn't work. Um, it's interesting. I saw an interview with him. He didn't blame anyone. He had kind of people, I think, ready for him to fail when he went there because he was so young and he hadn't really, you know, hadn't been a footballer himself, as it were. Um, I think. You know his his issue. He said was was not having a full preseason. He joined the mid season. It didn't last very long. I get the sense that he's one of these guys who, and this may be proved wrong as he gets older, but I get the sense that he's an incredible coach, incredibly clever guy at analysing tactics and everything. But perhaps just doesn't have that next or that slightly, that thing about him to be a head coach. I, that may be wrong. It may be that he does, and that he's just still, as I said, with Parrot as a player, educating himself and learning and developing, and that may be the case. But I get, and I'd say this in a good way, not a bad way, I get AVB vibes from him when I read about his his views on the game and all of that. I see a guy who's very, very, very clever. Very clever. Um, very, very knowledgeable about the game, and he tries to do things in a... In, a, in an innovative way. Um, and yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Very trusted member of his Spirit of Santo side. After that, didn't work with Hearts. He took a year out and then went back and worked with the um, Spirit of Santo at Wolves. And uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what he does at Tottenham. You'll see him in the training photos. Uh, Red headed chap, very, uh, very young looking. He sometimes has a beard, but he hasn't at the moment, I suppose, which makes him look even younger. Be, I'd love to interview him at some point to pick his brains on the game. It would be really fascinating. And, you know, this is a guy that in his early 20s went off to Portugal and Spain, didn't speak the language. And I think he is now fluent in Portuguese. I think he's got a very good grasp of Spanish as well. So, very clever, adaptive guy. And it'd be fascinating to see how he fits into the whole Tottenham Hotspur ethos. Um, Rui Barbosa, the goalkeeping coach, has come with. He's a long time. Um, Espirito Santo collaborator, as is Antonio Diaz, the fitness coach. So, you know, it's an interesting one because Espirito Santo had a big backroom staff at Wolves, big. And to only have brought in three people with him, uh, be intrigued to see whether that kind of grows slightly as the weeks go on. I know, and his name has completely gone out of my head, but certainly his assistant head coach at Wolves hasn't come with. Cathro has stepped up into that role. He was that previously to Espirito Santo, but at Wolves because he joined in a bit late. He was first team coach there, but he's stepped back up to be his assistant head coach. So, yeah, be interesting to see how the dynamic works, how Spirit of Santa works without that bigger coaching staff that he's been used to. Um, Ledley King obviously has gone back 
to being uh, kind of more ambassador for the club. I'd be interested to see kind of exactly the reason behind that. As I've said many times in these videos before, Ledley was learning his coaching badges. He didn't have them. He was This was why he was first team assistant, not first team assistant coach or whatever. He very much wasn't a coach. He was a guy that was studying. They obviously let him kind of tell them, tell him how to lead sessions and he would lead like little parts of sessions and you'd see him talking to the defenders before games. But, you know, I've seen people saying, oh, our defence was rubbish last year. It's Ledley's fault. He must be a crap coach. And it's like, that's not what it is about. He was at these sessions very much as a guy learning his trade. So I find it fascinating to know whether this decision has been made by Ledley, whether he's felt it's time to just step back and maybe get his coaching badges if he's going to continue doing them behind the scenes with the academy, um, or whether it was something that Espirito Santa didn't want. I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised um, if you know just having this extra member of staff who was already there on your coaching staff would be such a big deal for the Spirit Centre. So it kind of leads me to believe that maybe maybe Ledley or the club has made this decision. But we'll find that out. We'll sure find that out. Ryan Mason, as I said, has gone back to his um, head of development role for the uh, Academy of the Under-17s to Under-23s, uh, which he was very, very good at from what I understand. <clears throat> so we'll see him as a head coach one day. Um, maybe elsewhere and then he'll come back to Tottenham, but certainly that'll be in his future. He's only just turned 30, I think, recently. Um, I think only a few days ago. So long, long road ahead of him. And, I, and I'm and i one of those who I think, well, I've said it before, I think he did a very good job in the circumstances, in tough circumstances. Um, people who have these criticisms of him, but I thought for a then 29-year-old to win four out of six Premier League games, get the team into, you know, into seventh with all the rubbish going on around him, a Super League, Kane, Bale speculation, everything. Um yeah, I think he did absolutely fine. So, yeah, be interested to see what happens with him coming up. But that's the coaching staff. Um, let's talk about transfers. I wouldn't say there's, there's huge stuff to talk about transfers. What I would say is I'm going to talk a little bit about the way Fabio Padatici works, which I've been doing a lot of research into recently. Um, I think I saw, for I think it was Fabrizio Romano, uh, spoke slightly about it, or, or I saw a tweet that, said something about the way that Paratici works. So that led me, obviously, to go off and, and talk to people that have worked with him in the past and everything. And, yeah, it's really interesting. It's 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 a mad way of doing things, but if it works for him... So what he does is he will... When he's looking for a player to fill a certain role within a club, he will go into the transfer market and he will negotiate deals, quite a few of them to an advanced stage, for up to 10 different players for that one position. Um, he will then, at the end of that process, when he's got his certain number of ones that he kind of feels like right, I can pull the trigger on one of these, he will pick his man. Um, now, if you think about it, that's one position. So let's, for just for example's sake, say he wanted a centre-back, right-back, central midfielder, striker, um, you know, if he's going up to 10 for all of those, think of the spider web. It reminds me of that... Um, Zach Galifianakis. Oh my God! What a name to try and pronounce when I can't pronounce the simplest of names. Galifianakis. I don't know. The guy from The Hangover. There's that um, little gif you see of him doing all the numbers, and that for me is what Paratici must do because he, at one point, could have about fifty, um, you know, possible transfer negotiations going on, which is mind blowing to me. I mean, there's pros and cons to the way of working that way. Um, you know, people who, who know him have said it's like. It is mad to see him work, and it's it it brings with it benefits and it brings with it problems. So benefits, obviously, you have these all these players that the clubs and the players they can't force their transfer fees up or their wages up because they know they're wanted because they know there's all these other players lined up that if you're not happy with what they're demanding or asking for, you just switch your attention to someone else. So that kind of keeps that at a low uh, or a realistic level, I guess. Um, and obviously, you know, it also um, gives you a real proper grasp of players rather than just going down one avenue. Um, but then the downside, obviously, is that you're going to have a lot of disappointed people who may have wanted to move. And, and also there's, um, you know, some players just want to feel wanted. They want to feel like they were the main choice. They were the one you wanted to sign and, and made to feel welcome. 
Um, there's that. But what I do am told as well is that Paratici has incredible, not only contacts across the whole game, but really strong relationships with every, almost every club, agent, whatever you want to call it. So I'd imagine they will very well know the way he works and that will have come at an accepted practice. And, you know, he signed so many players over the 11 years at Juventus. A hell of a lot of good... Obviously, there's some turkeys in there. Of course, there will be. Every club does. Some clubs more than others. Um, but certainly, he signed a hell of a lot of good young players, especially at Juventus as well. So it clearly works for him. Uh, I'm told he's similar to Daniel Levy and he's an absolute workaholic who works silly, unsociable hours. The phone is always glued to his ears. He never really switches off, which is must be how he can handle all this spider web of transfers. But it's going to be very interesting to see how this works with not only the fans, but us and you know, myself and the media as well, because we're used to stories linking every single player in the world pretty much to Italy and as I said before sorry to uh, Spurs uh, but as I said before with Paratici's arrival we were always going to see every single Serie A player linked with Spurs and with Nuno Espirito Santo's arrival we we're going to see every George Mendes client linked with Spurs but what we're now going to have the situation where there could be up to 10 players for one position that Spurs have actually spoken to. So reports will be correct in stating that Spurs are interested, Spurs have talked to their clubs about it. But the fans and the media, myself, are going to have to very much train ourselves to understand that that actually doesn't mean much. You know, there's no point, like, I can't really write an article saying, you know, he's the one, that's the one, Spurs are going to sign him. Because... In negotiate in the negotiation, the Spurs might go, okay, well you're missing us, but we go for you. And you know, Paratici will have be juggling all of these balls. It just depends which one he plucks at the last moment to choose. Um, so yeah, it's there's going to be echoes of the manager hunt. And it's going to sound. It will be painted that some players rejected Spurs. It will be painted that uh, Spurs don't know what they're doing. But very much anyone that watches this, please have this in mind that this is the way Paratici works. So don't get yourself maybe too overexcited if you see one link about a player. And also don't go overboard if that player doesn't materialise because there will, will be so many different reasons why it might not have happened. It may even be that they were 10th on that list of 10 choices. Um, it could be that the fee wasn't quite right in the end. It could be that the wages proved difficult. It could be that the budget had to be adjusted so that they could bring in a player in a different position. So they had to go for the slightly cheaper wage option. It's like... There's going to be a lot to this. Um, and yeah, as media, it's going to be a very new experience um, to write about. So, I mean, even just taking the uh, centre-back um, kind of example, I mean, I know uh, that they like, obviously, Jules Kunde at Sevilla. Uh, I know they like, um, I should say his name probably, Maxence Lacroix um, at Wolfsburg. Very... You know, there's a, there's a pattern here. They're young players. Lacroix especially has got a lot of pace as well. Um, they like Milenkovic at Fiorentina. They like uh, Joe Jim Anderson, who was at Fulham. Who obviously, he's a Leon player. They like Milan. Obviously, Milan Skriniar. They're keeping an eye on what's happening with Inter. Financially, a lot of problems. So, if you think about it, there's all those players they like. Um, which is kind of the buzz going to be very much the buzzword at Spurs, if even if it wasn't before. Um, and you're going to see certain ones of those will have talks that will progress a little bit further. Certain ones of those may not even get out of the the gate, as it were. And then eventually, you know, there, there's probably other ones as well that we're absolutely not aware of that they are also looking closely at, or what options that suddenly come onto the market and become available as the weeks go on. Um, so it'd be fascinating to see who they end up with. It really does. Obviously, there's Takahiro Tomiyasu as well. He's slightly different because I think he's being looked at more as a potential right back. Um, but he's he absolutely ticks every Tottenham box. You know, he's uh, he's young, very skillful. He's versatile. Versatile is the big thing for Tottenham, isn't it? He can play on at a right back. Uh, at right back, he obviously started off mainly as a centre back, but Certainly for Bologna, he's played mainly at right-back for them in Serie A last season. Um, he can also play 
on the left of the defence in a back three, you can play on the right of a back three, you can play in a back two on the left or right. Um, I don't know if he's actually played left back or not. I wouldn't be... Sh- actually, no, I think he has. I think I remember looking back at some of his previous games and he had as well. So this is a guy who clearly ticks a lot of Spurs boxes. And I think with him, if there's anyone that they can move a little bit quicker for, it's probably him, purely because I know there's, there's the Olympics coming up, which is going to be a bit of a pain in the backside because obviously he's um, going to play there with Japan. But they've got a little bit of money that's coming for Foyth. And I think you're looking at a similar kind of price tag, you know, just the kind of under 20 million, uh, probably just under. Um, and yeah, he's a guy that certainly I think would work well, depending on what system Espirito Santo uses. You know, if he uses a back three, he's your guy for either side of the back three. Um, or if you're going to play with a flat back four, he can play as your right back absolutely fine as well. So also obviously allows Oreo to head out the door as well if they can get a, a reasonable bid. So yeah, I mean, what else we had? We have a Toby Alderweireld. Toby Alderweireld has asked to leave Tottenham. Uh, did a little bit of kind of looking into that and apparently it happened some time ago. Um, and he, yeah, he wants to head off. I think the feeling is, is that he'd like to go back to... Um, Belgium preferably, or the Netherlands, obviously, where it used to be. Netherlands, obviously, Belgium. Very closely connected. Um, I think Antwerp would love to have him back. Um, but whether the big thing with Toby is the, is the money side of things. He's got, uh, I think, two years left on his deal that he signed not long after Mourinho came in. He, yeah, the biggest issue is going to be, I don't think Spurs, I don't think Spurs would hold out for a huge fee. I mean, what we mustn't forget, I saw one report the other day saying they were holding out for 25 million. What we mustn't forget is that Toby Alderweireld, whatever you think of him, whatever you, however much you rate him or don't rate him, personally, I think he had a, probably was one of the better defenders at Spurs last season, and he was brilliant in the Carabao Cup final. Um, but what I would say is that when Toby Alderweireld, probably more, I wouldn't say at the peak, because it still happened after, I think t- peak Alderweireld was before his serious hamstring injury. But just after that, when he was getting back to being probably Spurs' maybe best defender, it was Vertonghen was starting to decline ever so slightly. He had that summer when his contract, um, they, they took the option to sign him up for another year on his, uh, on his contract. And with it, that, it opened up a £25 million clause that anyone could sign him during that summer. Nobody even bid. Not even a bid, let alone £25 million. Nobody bid. Um... And, you know, that just, just kind of leads me to think, look, I, I, I can't see Spurs looking out for a big fee for a guy who, is he 31, 32 maybe now? Um, and if they weren't going to pay that sort of money then, I can't see it happening now. And the bigger thing as well for Alderweireld is that I think he's, you know, one of the club's higher earners. I think he earns, you know, six-figure sum a week. Belgian clubs and pretty much probably most Eredivisie clubs, if not all, won't be able to afford that, um, especially with a fee on top. So some there's going to have to be some compromise there, you know, whether it's out of their old compromise. I think I saw some quotes from the other day saying that he wants his his youngest child, who wasn't born too long ago, to, to grow up and go to school in Belgium. So there's a desire there to go back. Um, obviously, he served Spurs for a long old time. Did he come in 2004? 15 summer I think it was so he's been there six years um obviously I know there are fans that will want other defenders to go first and they're very much dependent I think on, on what what bids come in but when you've actually got out of world who wants to leave the club I think obviously you have to look to to make that happen first really um it'd be interesting to see that because you're losing a lot of experience with him you know you then suddenly you don't have anyone kind of that even the uh, was, was Eric Dyer's technically was he 27 now, maybe 28? I'm not even sure how old he is. Um, whether he sticks around or not, I, d- I don't know. Again, it would it would depend on the bid. Um, it really would. This is We're all very quick to want players to move on, but we're, you know, unless you're going to go there and actually get a club to bid for them, it's a very different thing. It doesn't really work like that, football. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Spurs want to bring in at least one new centre-back, if not two. And I'm not entirely sure that two involves Tommy Asu either. I think, like I said, I think he's primarily will be seen as a right-sided player. Um, but obviously, 
a bit like Jaffa Tanganga, will be able to play in centre uh, central defence as well. Be interesting to see. I mentioned Tanganga, you know, will Espirito Santo look at Tanganga and think, you know what, I actually think you're a really good centre back. Let's play you there, which might solve an issue in itself. But um, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with that defensive stuff. Like I said, there's so many players that they like and have kept an eye on. Um, and from what I understand, they're just looking. Defence is a priority. They messed around too long. They, they brought in other players last summer before fixing the defensive issue. And that was why, you know, you saw it. They kind of got to the end of the summer and they they didn't... Well, it was Skriniar, wasn't it? They wouldn't pay the $45 million that Inter wanted for him. Whether that would have been the case at the start of the summer, I don't know. But I'd imagine having signed all of the other players before that, your budget obviously is going to be lessened. You cut your cloth accordingly. Um, so from what I understand, the priority very much is getting the defence sorted first this summer. And then you start to look at other options as well. But obviously, as we know, that may result in certain options then being off the table because other clubs might snap them up, you know. Um, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see. I, I know there were some links with even like Pjanic at Barcelona, who are an absolute mare. That's even without trying to re-sign Messi. Um, but from what I understand, at this stage, Spurs aren't, uh, trying or attempting to sign Pjanic. Obviously, you'd have to see how his de- uh, situation develops. If he were to suddenly become available for a free, I still think he'd then ask for huge wages because of that situation. But um, he's a funny one. doesn't really f- sit as a Tottenham profile signing for me because his age. I think he's 31. Didn't have the greatest season at all in Barcelona, but I don't know whether there was more politics behind that. I don't, I don't know, to be honest. I, don't, I'd, I didn't watch too much of kind of his situation and how he played but certainly didn't play a lot having looked up uh, all the various stuff about him but yeah as of as of this moment not someone at Spurs are currently trying to sign whether that situation changes as his does we'll have a look because obviously Paratici knows him very well from Juventus um, and he was the man that I think sorted out that deal to uh, to Barcelona with I think it was Arta coming the wrong the other way the wrong way the other way uh, but yeah so prepare yourselves for a very messy transfer summer um, they need to get people in soon. You know, we're in pre-season. I'm always a big believer that you should really have your transfer business, a lot of it sorted within the first week or so of pre-season so that these players can come straight in, get involved. Obviously, now we've got this very different thing with isolation, with people having to come back and isolate. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be stunned if some of the current players come back from pre-season, that was a bit of an issue as well. But... Um, yeah, I know. The Spirit of Santo, they had to get the Spirit of Santo in first. They had to know exactly what kind of head coach they were getting so they knew exactly what kind of players to then bring in. But as always, and I'm kind of I just get fed up with hearing myself say this, but Spurs need to get players out the door. You know, there's clearly players that Spurs would be happy to let go. And I think you're looking at Aurier and probably Alderweireld. Uh, I'd imagine you're looking at Lamella and Sissoko as well. Whatever you're thinking, I'm, I like Lamella a lot. But, you know, with 12 months left in his contract, his history of injuries, um, you know, I think they'd accept a bid for him if it came in. That seems to be what I'm being told as well. Um, Sissoko, you know, is another one, a bit of an older player who earns a lot, who I'm sure they probably would like to see off the wages. Uh, Lucas is an interesting one. I was told it was unlikely that he'd be gone, um, although I was also understand that he's, he's one that, Spurs could get a fair bit more money for, for, for than, than other players. I know they certainly turned down a, a big bid for him only a couple of years ago. Um, so, yeah, but they need to get the players out the door. You know, this is this, this was one thing that people said about Paratici in Italy was that maybe he was so good at getting players in the door, but he wasn't always the best at getting them out. And sometimes the Juventus were left kind of saddled with some players on big wages. I'm hoping that that's not the case at Tottenham because they need outgoings. They need to create space in their wage structure. They need to create transfer you know, funds as well because uh, if they don't, they're going to have to have to sort out those long-running naming rights for the stadium or they're going to have to find some money from somewhere because they can't be left behind this summer. They just can't afford to. You know, you look at United buying Sancho. Uh, City will be busy. Look, Spurs, I don't think, are going to let Harry Kane go. I don't think they are. Everything I've been hearing and still hearing doesn't sound like he's going to be let go at all. Uh, he's going to they're going to accept bids for him, and I don't think anyone will bid the sort of money that Tottenham would even pause for a moment to think about. Um, 
but you're seeing other clubs start to strengthen now and uh, I know the transfer window is open way into the season I think it's end of August isn't it so they do have more time but the sooner the better for a new manager to settle his squad um, really you know he needs all the help he can get <laughs> no no espresso centre uh, just to finish off obviously uh, international wise Giovanni Lo Celso is a Copa America winner which is fantastic for him it's brilliant and he's been very good um, I think in the final I haven't seen it yet I'm going to watch it later um, I understand he came off a little bit earlier because he had a yellow card but again apparently a, a good performance and he's had a few of those other than a little knock that kept him out of a couple of games he's been very good so now he'll get a little bit of a break and it'll be interesting to see how this works now whether he comes back and has a mini preseason of sorts or the fact that he's kind of he wasn't playing massively towards the end of the season anyway so to then this Copa America almost can kind of act as his preseason perhaps we'll see uh, we'll see how it works with him. Davinson Sanchez finished up. Th- uh, he won the third place match with Colombia, so he'll come back with a, you know, a little bit of a, a, a spring in his step. You'd think they did very well, and apparently he he played well as well during the tournament. And then of course we have England, and uh, this evening, um, I really hope that if you're watching this and it's Monday, that we can look back and say, "Wow, that happened," and that we're not thinking. Oh, man, they did as proud, though. Um, but we'll see what happens. For Harry Kane, for me, he's already one of the best strikers in the world, if not the best in his exact role of what he does. Um, but he can absolutely write his name in history. You know, he's only two. I think he'd need two goals or a goal and two assists to get the golden boot. I think he's one. He's got four goals. Ronaldo has five and Schick has five. But the, how they do the golden boot is if you are level on goals, then the person with the most assists as well gets it, which I think Ronaldo's got one, Schick has got none. Then if you've got the same goals and assists, it goes down to goals per minute, which Ronaldo would win because they got out of the round of 16. So for Kane, like I say, he hasn't got, I don't think he's got any assists yet. He'd have to get a goal and two assists against Italy or score twice, um, which is what England to win, let's be honest. But I was just thinking, well, the reason I'm talking about a golden boot is what an amazing feat it would be if Kane was currently the World Cup Golden Boot winner, European Championships Golden Boot winner, and the Premier League Golden Boot winner. If that doesn't say the man is the best bloody striker in the world, I don't know what does. That would be incredible. I mean, even even if... I'm sure he'd be happy not to even score a goal tonight and that England and he leads England to the World Cup... Uh, sorry, to the European Championship trophy. Um, it would. It's already made history they have just to get into the final... Um, but yeah, uh, that'd be awesome. And then you know you'd have the you'd have at Tottenham the World Cup winning captain, the European Championship winning captain, and in the GL of Celso someone who's just won the Copa America as well over there. But you know, let's not get ahead of uh, get ahead of ourselves. Italy have been brilliant. I think they've been one of the best teams for me to watch in the tournament, and this will be a test like no other. Um, for England that they've experienced thus far. England have done very, very well. I wish said the Denmark game was going to be incredibly tough, way tougher than the Germany game, and and it was. Um, and they came through it, showed a hell of a lot of kind of the mental side of the game. And, you know, Kane, obviously, how rare is it for him to miss a penalty, but also the fortunate to get the ball back um, and score. So, yeah, I hope we've got some good stuff we can talk about. I really, really hope we can um, in the next one. Um, and obviously, will then only then will we start talking about whether if big if England win it, whether that would be enough to sate Harry Kane's trophy desire for now. He always said that that was his club. Sorry, winning with his country would be more important than anything he did with the club. Um, but that's a whole other discussion we'll have if he does it. They got a massive, massive roadblock in the way in Italy right now, who've been phenomenal. So yeah. So that's everything I think we've covered so far. Um, transfer stuff will will increase, of course it will in the coming weeks. We'll have way more to talk about. And like I say, I'm going to be at every single preseason friendly. I'll be able to tell you way more kind of in-depth stuff of what I saw and how they played. And hopefully we'll get to talk to Espirito Santo a fair few times as well. We'll get some real beliefs from him on everything. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm... I'm I've got that little bit of buzz back, which is great. It's not just about England stuff. I think it's about Spurs and a new season and 
possibly <laughs> naivety and hope that comes with every new season. Um, but I'm just intrigued to see how how it all goes and how it plays out. Who comes in, who goes out the door, and how Tottenham play their football. We want to enjoy our football again. We really do. So hopefully the Spirit of Santo can bring that. Um, but we'll see. Right, I'm going to head off now. Get, uh, start building up for the match later. Um, but hopefully this gave you a little bit of an insight that you can kind of pass on the time before you watch it. And if you're watching this afterwards, like I say, hopefully it was a good night for all involved. Um, and as always, stay safe, stay healthy, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye. <laughs>